Hi, I'm Jeffrey. Uh, last week I joined the Frontside team. Uh, you've already heard that name a couple times today. If you've been in this meetup before, you probably know that crew, maybe. Uh, so when, when Rob uh, volunteered me to speak tonight, uh, I was thinking about an Ember training course that I took a few years ago, uh, and then the awesome Emberitas workshop that took place last month. And I was thinking about what are the really important things to cover in an intro to Ember lesson like that. This is pulled straight from the Ember docs. Uh, Routing, templates, components, controllers, models, miscellaneous application concerns, and testing. Those are the important things that you really need to learn in an intro course. Down at the bottom of the models section, I'll zoom in on that, we've got some other stuff. And down at the bottom of there, you've got customizing adapters and customizing serializers. Uh, probably those aren't going to show up in most intro courses, but they can be vitally important to building Ember apps in the real world. In an ideal scenario, we never have to touch those things, and I'll explain why. But if you don't have 100% control over your back end, um, you're going to have to deal with adapters and serializers, period. You consider this talk uh, the sequel to an Ember intro course, Introduction to Customizing Ember Data Serializers and Adapters for Your Special Snowflake APIs. <laughs> we're going to cover s some of these things. Uh, so we're going to, the default kind of adapters and serializers, some other ones you can use that used to be the default. If you really have to go fully custom, we're going to use the base ones. And also we're going to talk about avoiding some of this work, because um, that would be good. So let's quickly review some Ember basics to kind of set the table for us. Uh, Ember prioritizes convention over configuration. Let's solve this problem once and not have to solve it again. In an ideal world, we never have to muck around with APIs that are not conventionally formatted exactly the way we expect them to be. Ember Data is the library that pulls in into Ember CLI. It makes it easy to retrieve data from your server. It updates back to the server when you save stuff, creates new records in your app, and so on. And it solves by default. At this point, probably if you're using an Ember app, you've probably got Ember Data in there. I remember back in the day when it was, uh, maybe you didn't want to do that. But most apps, I, I would say these days, probably are. Here's an Ember Data model. It has some attributes, a name, a profile, has a relationship with this other model, cool. And now to access data of this model type, we do something like this from a root. This would find all of the users that are in my, my backend store, if, if I've got everything hooked up to Ember Data correctly. Or we could find a specific model record. Um, let's say, just give me back the user that fits this ID that I passed into this function, cool. So these are all the different things that we can do with our data. We can create records, we can delete our data, we can find all of the data of this type, we can find a specific one, we can also do a search query, we can search query for a specific one. So yeah, we'll come, we'll come back and look at these a few more times, because these are important. So by default, Ember Data expects JSON API. Uh, this is a fairly new thing. It's a specification to standardize the way we send data between the front end and the back end. Uh, this is from their website. In general, Ember Data's goal is to eliminate the need for ad hoc code per application to communicate with servers that communicate in a well-defined way. Some servers like Firebase, Parse, and CouchBB, Couch and Pouch actually, already define strict communication protocols for clients and were good fits for Ember Data out of the box. In contrast, servers written in Node or Django tended to be written in a REST style that was conventional, but not as strict about its conventions. And so they lacked the precision necessary for just dropping it in and making it all work like magic. And that's really what we want Ember to do, is be magic as much as possible and just take care of this for us. So if you have 100% control of your API, or you're starting a new API from scratch, use this as often as possible. The idea is gaining a lot of traction in a lot of different languages. In an ideal world, your Ruby, PHP, Java, Python, Node, whatever backend would use exact JSON API formatting to talk to your JavaScript, also your iOS and Android apps. Uh, maybe you've got something else new that's cutting edge and Oculus or something, I don't know. Uh, if you have the privilege of doing that, you have to do zero customization to your Ember data adapters and serializers. It's supporting this idea over and over again, convention over configuration. We'll solve it once and never again. Um, so JSON API supports this. I'm going to ignore authentication and authorization stuff today. That's another talk. I'm also going to ignore local data stores. Let's not deal with browser storage. And just focus on connecting to a remote backend. It's another server that we're going to connect to. 
So JSON API is the world your app was born into. Consider yourself very lucky. The rest of us deal with APIs our team doesn't own, dated implementations, or backend that it's just, let's do it our way, even if it's not always the best for the Ember app. And that's the heart of what this talk is about. Special Snowflake APIs. Uh, for whatever reason, the API you need to work with doesn't exactly match the JSON API spec. That's when we need to use adapters and serializers. I should clarify, though, that calling APIs that don't conform to JSON API special snowflakes can come off a little condescending. Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to put down developers that, who make a different choice. Um, that's just a shortcut catchphrase that fits this topic really well. Um, sometimes it just doesn't make sense to go with a JSON API spec. Uh, at my last job, we had an API that was working on a very early version of the JSON API spec, and we never had the opportunity to update it because the libraries just weren't there for iOS and Android. Um, now they are, but you run into situations like that. I've seen several well-constructed backends where a team's language of choice just, just doesn't have the right library yet. Um, and that d decision makes perfect sense for your needs. That said, when we do have this situation, Ember Data gives us two tools to deal with special Snowflake APIs, adapters and serializers. Let's start with adapters. It's an object that receives requests from a store and translates them into the appropriate action to take against your server. And then a serializer formats the data sent to and received from the backend store. So this is my shortcut slide that I kept looking at to remind myself, because I forget this all the time myself. You need an adapter when making changes to the actions around your data, and you need a serializer when you're making changes to the formatting of the data itself. Um, adapter, actions, serializers, format. So let's actually look at some of the code of these. Uh, Here's a, the, just the base generated JSON API adapter when you do Ember G adapter, blah, blah, blah. Um, and a basic use case of something that we might need to do here that's pretty simple is just change where our API lives. So here we can tell Ember data, um, hey, go hit this host. This is where my API lives. My API doesn't live on the same server as, as my Ember app. Or a lot of times uh, you'll version your API. And so we can use a namespace for that. It'll be like slash v3.2. Uh, maybe we need to spin some special headers into it uh, if we're using, say, a public API that has an API key. Um, a lot of times we'll want to mask that, but this is fine for this example. Uh, we also have some other things that we can customize in the adapter. Um, if we are making changes in our data locally, in, our, in the browser, uh, these methods will tell the adapter whether or not we should go make a server call. Um, and, see if a relationship has changed or something and go ahead and refresh everything. Now remember those store functions we looked at earlier? Creating, deleting, finding, querying. For each of these in an adapter, there's an available URL for fill in the blank method if you need to override the URL for just that call. It's a really nice shortcut. Pretty easy to remember. You just throw a URL for in there. This is a, an example one. Uh, maybe find record has, uh, let's say the rest of my user calls are just at slash user. Get users. Uh, get users query string equals this. Uh, but in this case, maybe I have a special snowflake endpoint uh, for whatever reason, it happens. Um, that's called get the users. I can override just that endpoint. And this is way easier than having to build out an entire Ajax call um, that does all this manually. We can just tell the adapter, hey, this is easy, go, go here. There are a couple of other utility methods, but that's a basic JSON API adapter. So we covered actions. Let's look at formatting stuff in a serializer. Here's kind of a basic JSON API serializer. Uh, it's got these HTTRs, those map property names between the server and your local version of your data. So in this case, the Ember app property name is on the left. Somewhere in your Ember data models, you have an attribute called admin. But when you get it back from the server, it's called isAdmin. And you've got to be able to tell your Ember app, hey, translate this appropriately. This is the way to do it. Or at least the easiest way to do it. Um, so your, your Ember app, left, server on the right. We've also got a few other things uh, in serializers called key for. Uh, there's key for attribute, key for link, key for relationship. These are all types of data that you'll get back from your server. And this tells Ember Data how to translate that. Um, so in this case, let's say in your Ember Data, all of your 
attributes are camel cased. Uh, they've got the first letters of words uppercased. Um, but coming back from your server, maybe they've got dashes, they're kebab cased. Um, and we need to tell Ember Data, hey, switch this around so that uh, Ember Data knows what it's reading. So if you've got a case uh, where most of your application works one way, most of your endpoints are pretty consistent, but maybe your endpoints are only different for the user model, we can work with that with Ember Data too. If we create another adapter that extends the application adapter, we can customize stuff for just the user model. Uh, so it's a really powerful framework to be able to customize down to the nittiest, grittiest little thing, um, but do it in an elegant way that doesn't require a lot of messy code. So if you've got a data source that matches the JPN API spec, those customizable things, the few that we looked at right here, probably all you'd have to do. Uh, but let's say you've got a more RESTful API um, that's coming from something like Rails um, that doesn't have all the bells and whistles of a JSON API uh, implementation. Ember Data can help you there too. Uh, so before Ember 2.0, the default adapter and serializer were actually this one, the REST adapter and serializer. They worked really great if you were using Rails with an active model serializer backend. It took a lot of customization to work with a lot of other things, and that's why JSON API is a thing. But this is still here available for us to use if this fits our data model better. It looks a whole lot like a JSON API adapter. In fact, everything you can do with a JSON API adapter, you can do with a REST one. We just extend from a different class, and the method is, methods and properties are the same. But we should look at a couple things that come up more often when you're looking at a REST adapter versus a JSON API adapter. So remember these, all the available store functions. In an adapter, we can actually completely implement each one of these ourselves. Instead of just giving the URL, maybe there's something really special about that endpoint that we really need to process. Uh, so here's an example. This is actually the straight from Ember Data's source code. Um, this is what they do in the REST adapter. We can completely customize any of this code to do exactly what we need it to do. I recommend avoiding that if it, you at all can, um, but this is how you can do it. So let's look over at serializers in this world and how we can adjust the format. Uh, we have a few methods that we can override in REST serializers. Here's actual serialized code from Ember Data's core. I wouldn't focus too much on what it's doing, but uh, it's, it's basically ingesting all the data from the server and figuring out what to do with it. Again, we can completely customize this to be exactly what we need if we need that high level of customization. And here's another useful serializer method, normalize. It converts what uh, your server gives you to what your Ember app wants to see. So the last method did the reverse. So what if the data store that you want to connect to, it's not JSON API. It's maybe not very restful. Maybe it's not even JSON. Maybe it's uh, XML. Uh, I'm scared for you if it is. But sometimes we gotta deal with that. And Ember Data can't help us a whole lot there, but it gives us a basic structure to work with if that is the case. Um, so this is a base generated ad adapter. If you remember the last couple were generated for exporting JSON API adapter, then there was export REST adapter. This time we're just using a base level adapter. This is the bare bones minimum of what Ember Data thinks an adapter should be. And we can implement each of these in their entirety in a base level adapter. Serializers uh, only have three base methods, and really only two that you even need to worry about. There's normalized response, and that takes your server response, and it turns it into a format that Ember Data is like, oh, okay, I know what's going on here, cool. And then we need to do the reverse, too. We need to translate what Ember Data has and the way that Ember Data stores its data and turn it into a format our server likes, and that's what you can do in Serialize. So, testing this. Uh, we could easily spend an entire session on just that. So I'll just say it's important and we'll move on. Cool. <laughs> <laughs>
So there are several more properties and methods in adapters and serializers that I didn't cover. I covered most of the big ones. But anytime you run into a particular issue, check the docs. There's probably a method in there that'll help you either receive or send or parse your data correctly. Uh, this has all been thought out in a way that is structured and makes sense. Uh, the best way I found to learn is just to look directly at the Ember data source code. I had it in a few slides there. Some of it's really gnarly and complex, and some of it's actually pretty easy to understand. But in almost every case, the methods are really, really well documented in the source code itself. A lot of times, the documentation is actually longer than the method that it's describing to tell you exactly what it's doing. So look in that source code. It's great. All right, so we just jumped through a lot of hoops to get our Ember app to properly communicate with our backends. But what if we could make it easier? That'd be nice, right? First, always check to see if there's an open source Ember data adapter that fits exactly the tech stack you're working with. Uh, here are a bunch from Ember Cert Observer. Um, if you've got something like Firebase as your backend, there's already open source adapters out there that fit exactly what you need to communicate with Ember data. And you don't have to do any of this customization work. It's really nice. If you work on the back end, or if you're in close communication with your back end folks, encourage using one of these libraries that's already out there for serialization. Um, but if you're in a situation where you just can't make those kind of wholesale changes, but you can make little ones, there's some baby steps you can take to make developing with Ember data a little bit easier. Here's a really simple example. A lot of times in a RESTful implementation, you'll get back an array of a data type called something like users. In JSON API, that's been changed a little bit so that the top level element is data. And then you return for each individual resource what type it is. That's a simple change you can make just to get a little bit closer to what JSON API is doing and means less customization in your adapters and serializers, specifically your serializers. You could start a relationships key. Uh, so JSON API has, has put a lot of thought into how do you describe a related resource? Uh, in a RESTful implementation, all the, a lot of times, all you're going to be sending is IDs. Uh, but it's really nice to be able to actually get back the whole objects without having to make another call. Here's another little thing you could do. Uh, you could start including. Uh, this is also a JSON API construct. Um, so you can at least get part of the way there, even if you can't get the complete sim simplicity of the default adapters and serializers. So the uh, too long didn't listen. If you remember one thing from this, because yeah, this is what I'm going to remember from this, adapters edit the actions around your data, serializers deal with formatting it, and both are completely customizable. Uh, and hopefully you can customize it as little or as much as you need to. Ember prioritizes configuration, convention over configuration. And in an ideal world, we'd never have to muck around with unconventionally formatted APIs. But in the meantime, I hope you learned a few little tricks and some tools we have to deal with these unperfect scenarios. I'm Cher Wadi, all over the internet. And good luck with your special Snowflake APIs. <laughs>